Hello, um, it's John Drummond here uh, from the Giz Gisborne Astronomical Society. Uh, I've been asked to give the talk to to you, to the Auckland Astronomical Society tonight. So, so basically, um, a, a title for that I came up with tonight was the antics of an amateur astronomer, uh, what we get up to at night, and so on. So. This will be a bit of a photographic uh, journey, and I'll be showing you my equipment and then basically what I do with the equipment uh, photographically and also scientific-wise. And then um, then I think at the end of that, uh, Steve will read out a few questions, and pretty much that's, that's, that's it for the night. Um, for those who don't know, I'm, I'm the Secretary of the Royal Astronomical Society of New Zealand. I was the, I'm the immediate past president. And last year, I was, I was made a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. So so really stoked about that. It was a great honour. So I'll just launch into my photos. Um, so, Steve, can you see New Zealand here? OK, that's good. OK, so... Um, so, yeah, so basically uh, where I am is Gisborne, and I'll just zoom in here, and here's Gisborne City. It's got about 30,000 people. I'm out here about pretty about 10 or 12 kilometres to the west of Gisborne at a place called Patatahi, which means in Māori uh, a, a small isolated village, and um, so that's where I do most of my astronomy from there. And... Here's some of my observatories, and now there's a couple of more. They sort of spring up like mushrooms, believe it or not. And this this photo here was actually taken um, with with a real rainbow in the sky. It's not an artificial artifact here. It's um it's a real uh, real rainbow. Uh, let's see. We'll just go through. So. This is a 35 centimetre or 14 inch Schmidt Cassegrain, uh, sort of like Jenny, Jenny McCormick's telescope um, tube. Uh, it's on a Paramount MX mount. And there's the camera at the back. It's a um, S big STL 11000. So basically a full 35 mil chip. And with this uh, setup, I do a lot of astrophotography, but also um, scientific work with astrometry. Uh, micro lensing, not so much now, but more so a, a couple of years ago. Gravitational micro lensing, and um, and and other work. Other telescopes are the forty-one centimeter or sixteen-inch Newtonian telescope. For those who don't ha know how it works, it's got a big mirror down here. Light comes through the open end here, comes down, hits hits the curved mirror, comes up, hits the secondary mirror, and comes out the side to the um, to the camera there. So with this telescope here, I, I do quite a lot of astrometry, which is uh, basically taking photos of, of comets and asteroids and so on and working out their longitude and latitude in the sky and, and sending those observations over to Massachusetts and they get uh, meshed together with other people's observations and we can work out the orbits of these objects. Um, Another little one is this is a little dinky uh, 18 centimetre, so about a 7 inch or so f2.8. So it's a very short, dumpy telescope. And um, with this with this camera here, it gives a field of view of, oh, gee, it's about 4 degrees by 3 degrees. So quite a nice field. And in the back, you'll see there's another, um, this is a 270 to 200 mil, millimetre Sigma lens, just with a DSLR camera on it. So that's, that's more for wide angle um, imaging uh, of, you know, brighter comets and comet survey and things like that. Um, this observatory here, this is, is this, this was called Possum Observatory. This is the first observatory I, I um, had basically. And the whole building rotates. So if I leaned on that corner hard enough, then the whole building rotates and inside it, there's a uh, this telescope here, a 41 centimeter f 4.5 uh, Mead Newtonian, and on a on a uh, on a mount there. So I used to this used to be the workhorse. I used to do a lot of astrophotography and all that with this, but now I've moved on to other telescopes and um, other observatories. But still, this is a lovely observatory to use, and the whole 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 this part here rolls away to reveal the sky 
And if you want to then look over to an area, area of um, sky over here, you just lean, stand, stand on the wall, on the floor here, lean against the wall, and then push it, and the whole building rotates around on this ring. It's a, it's a P combine harvester ring down here. Um, yep. So I'll just show you the next folder. Uh, but basically, just recently, Comet Swan was in the sky, and uh, it, was, it was quite a nice object. It reached naked eye, about magnitude 5. Photographically, a tail was evident, but with the naked eye, uh, it, was, it was pretty hard to actually see a tail. And I must admit, it was a, quite a low eastern object. So uh, I think I read one report where someone had seen the, uh, seen the tail through a pair of binoculars. But these are just some photos. So basically, this was taken back in, let's see, late April, early May sort of thing. So about a month old. Um, and but photographically, it did have quite a nice tail, and it had some disconnection uh, events and and some nice streamers and so on. It was actually really nice just to see a, a, a comet with a you know bit of a decent photographic uh, tail, and to actually see a comet naked eye that was um, that was great. Um, this oh. This, this here was uh, just showing, I really processed it in Photoshop just to bring out the streamers. You can see that down here is the nucleus, and basically the nucleus of a comet is, is a, well, they call it a dirty snowball because it's a conglomeration of, of rock and gas and dust and so on. Very loose conglomeration. As that nucleus comes closer to the sun, it starts fizzing, and kind of like, I don't know, taking the bottle top off a coke uh, you know a bottle of coke and it starts fizzing and material starts throffing and it forms a cloud around the um around the coma the coma which can be really quite a large um large thing but very slight as far as actual material and the tail gets blown away by solar radiation so so it's actually nice to see the comet with a bit of a tail with this photo here, this was taken with a an 85 millimeter lens, and so the tail. Hopefully, you can see it on your screen. The tail came up to here, so it was about 12 degrees long. And like I say, visually you couldn't really see the the tail, but photographically uh, it was able to be picked up. So it's quite neat. Um, about a week or so ago, a Japanese magazine asked if they could use this um, use this comment in their publication over there, and Oh yeah, and that was that was just um, this. This was when it was getting really close to the sun, so not much elongation. wasn't very high in the sky, but you can still see some of the tail coming away from there. And I think that's it. And I'll just show you comets really interest me. And I'm doing a PhD with the University of Sun Southern Queensland on comets. And um, in fact, if anyone has any old historic observations of comets or knows of family members or great uncles or whatever who took photos or did observations of comets, I'd love to hear from you because my, my, the PhD I'm doing under the uh, supervision of Dr. Wayne, uh, Professor Wayne Orcherson, who's a, a noted historian around the world, will be on comets, but also the historical, um, a historical look of at comets from a New Zealand perspective. So if you have any observations, Steve knows how to get in touch with me. Um, so here's, this will just be a couple of photos of some of the nicer comets recently. Uh, this is my good observing buddy, John Burt, who's moved. Uh, he and his family left and moved down to Gisborne, uh, Nelson. But this was over Yannick's head, uh, Comet Lovejoy. And up here you can see the, the pointers Epsilon Centauri, Omega Centauri, uh, and it was this was in the morning sky at about Christmas time, and that was in 2011. So that, that was a nice comet to, to see. Uh, some of you might have seen Comet McNaught 2006 P1. This was up at Co the Coromandel at a Pottery Beach, and uh, it, was, it was by the stage it was a circumpolar comet, 
And this was on the night of the full moon or thereabouts. But even so, with all that moonlight around, you can you can still see the nice uh, tail of the comet uh, there. And I just got 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 some of the young kids to pose and you know look at the comet and so on. So always adds a bit of interest to a comet photo to put people in there. Sort of makes it more more relevant to humanity. Um, another comet Lovejoy photo. Uh, here are the pointers and the Southern Cross. And basically, this photo, this here is the International Space Station coming down here. So it was quite neat to actually see the ISS coming down here, and it just um, just clipped the comet. Um, they, well, the, actually, it didn't even have a head. They called it, called it a headless comet, basically. It was just a big tail. I don't think I can zoom in. No, no, I can't. Um, Probably one of the most spectacular comets I saw was was Comet McNaught. Now, Comet McNaught actually was visible in the daylight at daytime. So this photo here was around about, say, lunchtime. It's not often you can see a comet in the sky naked eye during the day. In fact, they say it's probably about once in a lifetime that you'll get to see a naked eye comet. So this might be it for me. Uh, but it was really neat to actually hold the fingers up to the sun, uh, block out the sun, and then it was just a matter of like three fingers at arm's length from the sun was was Comic McNaught. And of course, after after we hit this perihelion stage, perihelion meaning the closest point to the sun, then it, it sprang into the uh, into the western sky and started rising up by grass and so on. And uh, do I have a photo? Yeah, here we go. Started um, producing these. Uh, amazing striations in the tail as it started coming up into, into grass and, and whatever. That was actually taken from the, what was called the uh, uh, star, oh, star date uh, back in the, back at the time down in the Hawke's Bay. And this photo here, I took a number of exposures. So eight times 58 second exposures, stacked them all on the head uh, and you'll see the stars have moved, uh, moved because the comets moved during that those exposure time from woe to go. Stacked it on the head just to try and bring out as much detail in the in the tail as I can. And yeah, you can see it's just it really had a, a, a beautiful tail, uh, something to really to behold. I'd love to see all of you and see how many could raise a hand to say to say that you've actually seen the comet. It'd be really neat. Uh, this was the comet through a telescope, and again, it was just a, a bit of a blazing glory, really. It was a, a beautiful sight to behold. Now, one comet that Grant Christie, Jeannie McCormick, and I, and um, one or two else and other people in New Zealand have been monitoring is this comet here. It's called Comet 29P, Schwarzman Wackman. It's a really weird comet. It actually orbits beyond Jupiter, between Jupiter and Saturn, and it's pretty much a circular orbit. And so it doesn't come close to the sun. And because it doesn't come close to the sun, it doesn't get more solar radiation and start fizzing, start creating a big tail and all that. No, it, it, it sort of just sits out at the same distance from the sun, going around the sun every, what, well, there'd be about 13 years or so. But now and again, the comet will go from magnitude 16-ish, when it's quiet, up to about magnitude uh, 12 or 11. So it gets, 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 suddenly has these cryovolcanism events happening on the comet and will increase in brightness significantly. And then a few days after, up to a week or so after uh, the event happens, you can actually see the coma coming away from the nucleus here. And so it's a really, really weird comet. Uh, Richard Miles from the BAA, British Astronomical Society, uh, association is really keen on people around the world monitoring this comet because to actually pick it up as it does an outburst then we can get a lot more science on it and work out uh, how often these events will happen as the comet rotates and a crack might start facing the sun and, and material is spewed out from it and it creates um, this, this nice coma around it so that's a that's a that's a very interesting comet Okay, um, now my last last folder is this one here, and these are basically more general um, photos of of the sky, and 
If you cannot make it large, your screen. What's it say? No. Ah, it doesn't matter. Okay, so this is the Southern Cross for those who who, are, who know it, and the coal sack here. This was taken with a 150 millimeter lens, and a dollar for each one of those stars would certainly be handy to have in the bank. Eta Carina, not far from the Southern Cross. It's a um, it's a giant nebula in space, a hydrogen cloud in space where uh, stars are being formed. It's about seven and a half thousand light years across away. And at one stage, uh, let's see, in 1843, there was a star here that became the second brightest star in the sky. It's a very enigmatic star. It's, it's, it's sort of pulsates and gets bright now and again. And and uh, back then in, in, in 1843, it was second to Sirius in brightness. So an interesting object to look at. But the whole nebulosity around here is, is just such a beautiful thing to see. And about a month ago, I took another photo of, of it. And you can see it's slightly different from the previous one. And sometimes it's it's, it's to do with your processing that you do. Uh, which side of the tongue of the mouth you hold your tongue uh, can give you a slightly different rendition of it uh, because these were taken pretty much with similar equipment. But it's just interesting to see, you know, that I processed it slightly different in this this respect here. Um, <clears throat> a wide angle photo of the Horsehead Nebulae. So, this is in uh, near the pot, well, pretty much in the pot of Orion, near the base of the pot. And this is a very uh, rich region of, of hydrogen gas. With this photo here, I, basically I took it through a hydrogen alpha filter, and that, that picks up a lot more of the nebulosity um, than other filters. And it, it just shows just how, how, how much material there is um, in the in the sky, the 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 Horsehead Nebula is about fifteen hundred light years away. Okay, for those who don't know, there's a kiwi in the sky. So here's his beak, here's his head, here's his eye, here's his body coming around here, one leg, the other leg, and this is pretty much towards the heart of the Milky Way, uh, near Scorpius Sagittarius, or in that region. And it's quite a large object. When you look at a, a wide angle photo of it, you can actually see the, the the Kiwi sitting here. And this is part of the emu for the Australian Aboriginal people. They they saw that dark area as the emu, and it comes up to the head up here, which would be the coal sack near the Southern Cross. So it's quite neat to see the, the Kiwi and the emu, the Anzac spirit sort of in the sky. And just to put it in perspective, down here is um, is Antares, and you've got the three stars at the um, you know for the at the start of Scorpius, and it, Scorpius is coming around here. So you can see it's actually quite a large object, but it's more of a photographic object. You can see it naked eye if you have a nice dark sky, uh, and you can certainly see the pipe nebulae with the dark sky um, and some of the other other material too. Um, this one here, Lambda Centauri, again, uh, just a, a very rich region of, of hydrogen gas. And just these little dark uh, spots here, basically they're called Bok Globules, B-O-K. And it's quite interesting to think that these, in, in the future, they'll be solar systems in their own right, with a sun and planets and so on orbiting, orbiting them. So it's 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 really beautiful just to see these um, see these objects being formed out of this hydrogen cloud. Um, of course, you'll know the the uh, Large Magellanic Cloud, 170,000 light years away, and it's just got so much nebulosity and so on in there. And around here is the Tarantula Nebulae, and back in 1987. Uh, uh, there's a supernova here, Albert Jones, uh, who's passed away, a Kiwi, done over 500,000 variable star observations, uh, uh, an incredibly humble but incredibly dedicated observer. He was one of the first to see, uh, if not the first to see it explode 
uh, back in 1987. So, so yeah, so it it's, it's certainly is an interesting uh, galaxy. Possibly it, it might be a, this and the small Magellanic Cloud might be galaxies that are orbiting our own galaxy. Uh, so, yes, yeah, it's, it's kind of like the moon is orbiting the Earth. Well, these are probably orbiting, orbiting your own galaxy. Um, this is a an eclipse we had back in 2007, and I, I just stacked these images together, and there's, there's John Bird looking through the 16-inch, and you can see the shadow of the Earth as the moon is moving into the shadow, and it's quite interesting. Next time you do have an eclipse, get a coin, like a 50-cent a piece, hold it up, at arm's length, the move it in and out into the until the curve of the coin actually matches the curve of the shadow on the moon, and then you'll get an idea of how big the Earth is compared to the uh, to the moon. So it's um, it's just a good little physics trick trick to, to play with a fifty cent piece, just to match it on the curve of that. And you can see that the uh, the moon when it's completely moved into the Earth's shadow. Rayleigh scattering is is basically uh, chopping out the, um, the the shorter wavelengths of light, like the purple, indigo, blue, green, but the longer wavelengths of light, the the red, orange, yellow. Basically, those wavelengths of light are long enough that they can actually go through the Earth's atmosphere as the sun is on on the other side of the of the um, Earth from the moon. The the longer wavelengths of light go through the atmosphere and then they, they land on the moon and, and give it that beautiful uh, reddish uh, colour. And it's, it's quite interesting that uh, astronomers can help determine what's happening in the atmosphere of the Earth at the time that a lunar eclipse happens by how many pollutants are in the atmosphere and how dark the moon goes during during the um, during the lunar eclipse. Um Bit of astrophotography, the Sombrero Galaxy in, um, in, in Virgo, measure 104, beautiful galaxy. And um, yeah, I think it's about 67,000 light years across. So smaller than the Milky Way, but a beautiful one to see. And I can't zoom in, but uh, it's got this lovely dark, d dust lane going across here. And through a telescope, you can see under a dark sky with a you know fairly sizey telescope. You can certainly see the dark lane going across here, and the sombrero top and and down here. Um, the moon always nice to photograph. Uh, measure forty two, and again this was taken with the wide angle telescope, and you can see just how much uh, hydro, um, hydrogen there is. Uh, this is taken through a hydrogen alpha filter again, and I must put some colour on this sometime, but yeah, sometimes you take it in hydrogen alpha and think, oh, I must get the other colours and uh, blend them, but you just move on and forget to do it, so one day I'll do, do that. Uh, these are a lovely pair of galaxies in Leo at the moment. In fact, if you go out, well, tomorrow night without the moon in the sky, uh, you, you look not far from Beta, um, Beta's, Beta Leonis, and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see these these lovely galaxies, measure 65 and 66. And basically they're about, well, one's about, I think, now which one is it? One or the other is 56 million light years away and the other is about 32 million light years away. So, you know, the light from one of these, the, the more distant one, left that galaxy only only millions of years after the dinosaurs were wiped out. So during that time, for the last uh, 56 million years, it's just the light has been travelling from that galaxy through to uh, us to be photographed. So just shows you just how, how giant the universe really is. Uh, this was the moon just about to occult Jupiter. And a few seconds after this photo was actually taken, the moon did cover Jupiter, and if, if I could zoom in, you'd, you'd be able to see a couple of bands of, of Jupiter uh, going across there. And it's, it's, it's one of those perspective things where if you bring your thumb really close to your eye and look at a house 
off on the hill, the house will look a lot smaller than your thumb. Why? Because the thumb is a lot closer to your eye. And it's, it's just like that with this photo. The moon is just seems so much close, uh, larger because it's so much closer at 368,000 uh, kilometres, whereas Jupiter is um, getting out at, what? what is it, about 5.2 astronomical uh, units. So 5.5 5 5 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So it it's really is quite a long way away um, compared to the Moon. Uh, this is the Tarantula Nebulae and uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud. And it's, it's just a, a huge, massive, big nebulae, hydrogen cloud in space. It's about 170,000 light years across. Uh, sorry, away, but it's about 900 light years across. So it's, it's a whoppingly huge thing. Uh, I've heard people say that if they, if the Tarantula Nebulae was where Measure 42 in, in Orion is, it would basically cover like half of the sky and cast shadows. So just, just give you an idea of just how massive this thing is. Okay, uh, another piece of nebulosity in the sky. This is a uh, Thor's helmet. It's a Wolf Ray star, so a very energetic star. But it, it sort of does look like the old helmet that um, the Vikings would pour, put on, you know, the um, with the uplifted uh, parts here. Okay, um, again, hydrogen alpha. This is uh, just a around part of the Etacarina region. Is known as Caldwell 92, and it, it, it's incredible to think that our whole solar system would just be a pinprick like one of these tiny stars here compared to just how massive these hydrogen clouds are in space. Uh, talking about hydrogen clouds, they basically condense and, and, and star clusters are formed out of them. Very roughly speaking, the, the, the more small and tight a star cluster is, the younger it is. The larger and more spread out it is, the stars have had more time to spread um, over the over this over space. And this is the jewel box uh, pretty, sitting pretty much right beside Beta Crucis in the Southern Cross. And uh, John Hernshaw, not John Hernshaw, sorry, John Herschel, was the uh, the person who likened it to a box of jewels. And especially the star here, right in the centre, it's got a really nice reddish. Color it's like a some sort of ruby or something sitting in the jewel box, and the the jewel box is about um, about seven thousand eight hundred light years away, so it's a it's a really beautiful thing to to look at the through a telescope. In fact, I think it was the first thing I I ever looked at through a telescope, so it's, it always has fond memories for me. Now, not far from uh, the jewel box in that area of sky is Centaurus A. It's a, it's a very energetic radio source, uh, a galaxy possibly where, you know, there's been uh, cannibalism, a couple of galaxies merging, and um, it lies at about 15 million light years away, and in the radio frequency, you know, of the electromagnetic spectrum, we can see visible light, but there's other um, uh, waves in the electromagnetic spectrum, one of which is the radio wave. Apparently, it's got these giant big lobes coming out up and down here, which would cover about seven degrees of the sky. So it's, that's more distant from one end of the Southern Cross to the other. So that's how, how massive this thing is in the sky. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a nice object to look at. Of course, this, is, this photo is nothing compared to uh, Rolf Olsen's photos, that photo that he took of it with, um, oh, forget it, if, you, if you're listening, Rolf, I think it was about 150 hours or more, wasn't it, of, of exposure time. But it really is a lovely object to, um, to photograph and, and to look at. And sitting very close to Centaurus A is Omega Centauri, NGC 5128, uh, 39 I mean. And this here is about 15 million light years away. And it, it covers about two full moons in diameter. So it's a really large globular cluster. If it is a globular cluster, it might be the, the heart of a, a dwarf galaxy, perhaps. But it's, it's, it's really nice to actually sit under a dark sky, even a, you know, a light polluted sky. Still, you can still certainly see, um, see Omega sitting there. 
Uh, and just to think that it's just got all those stars, each one of those dots is a sun like our own sun. So it might be a bit of a boring sky if you're right in the middle of the globular cluster looking out in all directions. You just see stars in all directions. I don't know how much of the um, the, the universe beyond it you would, you would actually see, but through a telescope, great stuff. Now, this is going to be the future of our future of our sun where the sun in about five billion years roughly uh, will blow off the outer shell shell of, of gas and basically leave a, a white core in it uh, a remnant in the middle this 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 helix nebulae is in Aquarius and it's quite a large nebulae you you really need a, a nice pair of binoculars with a wide field to actually pick it up because it's quite a bit of a distance across there to actually see it photographically you start bringing out the oxygen and the hydrogen and and so on now for those just getting into astrophotography one interesting thing to do is is uh, do something like this where you plonk your camera onto a tripod don't follow the stars just let the stars move and the camera stay still but slightly defocus the lens and as you defocus the lens it actually starts bringing out the colour of the stars more. I believe that David Malin from the uh, Anglo-Australian Observatory in, in Australia uh, was the first one to do this <clears throat> and certainly does show the colour of stars. And then you can start telling your friends and, and kids at school and all that about the different temperature of stars, how you know the different colours uh, do give off different temperature and um, so on. Now... This photo was taken back in February of 2006. Dean, it was uh, taken, I, I went across out to the paddock across the road and this is just before sunrise and all the planets, all the naked eye planets are, are basically have formed are along the ecliptic here. So you've got Mercury, Venus, Saturn, Mars and Jupiter here and the bright one is, is the moon. And it, it sort of shows the muscle memory of the of our of our um, solar system as it formed out of the solar nebulae uh, about five billion years ago. So the the planets are still moving across what is called the ecliptic line, uh, and and just a like you'll never see Jupiter up with near the Southern Cross. They'll always be going through the signs of the zodiac. These twelve constellations where the ecliptic actually runs. So it's quite nice, and, and currently if you walk out um, at night and go out about 10 o'clock or whatever, you'll see Jupiter and Saturn sitting uh, nice, nicely, quite close together, and Mars is about, I think I measured it this morning, it was about 60, 60 degrees away from, from Jupiter and Saturn, but it's just quite nice to have these conjunctions where planets are sitting uh, close together. Okay, uh, Matadiki, the Pleiades, uh, a star cluster which is about 50 million years old, formed out of a, a giant hydrogen cloud, and it's in Taurus, the ball. And of course, for us in New Zealand, when we see Matadiki rising, sort of around about what the 20, 25th of June in the morning, just before the sun, uh, that ushers in the Māori New Year. And uh, it really is a lovely cluster to look at. It's quite a wide cluster, so it's best with binoculars to actually look at it and, and see it. And um, um, yeah, it's about 440 light years away. And from one side of the cluster to the other is about 30 light years. So yeah, it's got about a thousand members in there, but it it's, it's really is a beautiful object to see. For us in New Zealand, it's sort of low down in the in the northern sky. We can still see it very nicely, but uh, if you were in Germany or whatever, it would be right overhead. Okay, this was taken in 2005 in an astronomy uh, astro astrophotography camp, and I just I just like this photo because it basically shows uh, people under the stars enjoying the stars. I mean, that's what we're here for is is to um, enjoy the the universe around us. Oh, yep, talking about conjunctions, here's a, a conjunction of Venus and Jupiter and a couple of sh sheep on my farm. 
Uh, so I was sneaking, crawling around and, at night uh, on the ground because this sheep's lying on the ground and it's almost looking at me going, what the heck are you doing? Uh, this is called chocolate, this sheep. Uh, sadly, he's passed away now. But yes, this is when Venus and, and Jupiter were actually sitting really close in the sky together. And moving on from the pretty photos into more sciences, um, what I, I quite like doing is, is uh, taking photos of comets and asteroids and so on, especially newly discovered objects uh, and, and trying to get astrometry on them. And we send those observations off to the Minor Planet Center and they get meshed with other people's and then we can work out the orbit of, of where that comet is, is going and, you know, could it hit Earth down the track or, or whatever. So this was, I sent astrometry of this comet here, um, Swan, one that we saw previously, and it's quite neat to actually see in the observations. Uh, this just shows, like there I am there, E94, Possum Observatory, tells you the observer equipment and so on. And this is what a typical observation looks like. It gives you the RA declination, brightness, and, and, and your observatory code here, and the date, of course. So if you've got a telescope uh, with a tracking mount and a camera and all that, and think, you're thinking, what can I do with it? Well, astrometry is one uh, good area to actually get involved in. The w reason I, I like astrometry is because uh, not many people are doing astrometry in the Southern Hemisphere, and I, I sort of feel a bit of an obligation to actually try and track the comets and asteroids that uh, the people in the Northern Hemisphere can't see. And also, especially if they're newly discovered, and also at times there's times when the object might have set for South America and not ris have risen for um, for Australia, for example. So New Zealand is, is quite unique in that we sit in a, uh, what, what would you call it, a, 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 a dark region of longitude and latitude and that there's not many other people around us. So we are really fortunate to actually... Um, be able to do this and you know grant and grant christie and jenny mccormick from from auckland uh they they often do astrometry of of comets and asteroids and newly discovered objects too and send it over the overseas so even if you do have a light polluted uh, sky you can still be contributing science uh to over overseas astronomers and you know our observations are meshed together and and then um uh, circulars are sent out and professional astronomers are very interested in, in our observations and, and what is achieved and what's happening with, with the different objects. Uh, another, another thing I'm quite interested in doing is, is photographing galaxies and uh, seeing if there was previous cannibalism uh, where, where a couple of ca galaxies will merge. And this is a uh, this is a galaxy in Fornax called NGC 1097. And you can see here by stretching, I've plastered, pasted an ordinary image over the background image, which has really been stretched. And you can actually see that uh, there has been tidal interference, things happening uh, with this galaxy. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's just quite interesting. So what I do is try and photograph um, uh, galaxies, do a bit of a survey of galaxies, really stretch them, and if it looks as though there is um, tidal interaction there, then I'll, I'll take uh, many hours of exposure of that pair, stretch it, and see if there are, if there are tidal interactions and cannibalism and, and, and so on. Uh, here's another example. This is a very well-known example of, of a couple of gal galaxies merging, the antenna galaxies. And just using the small angle formula here, uh, by noting how long this this pace, this area subtends on the sky, you can actually work out, if you know the distance to it, that this, this arc here is about, what, 260,000 light years long. This one, about 190,000 light years long. So this will be the future of our own galaxy. Even as we speak, the, the Milky Way um, galaxy has been plummeting towards the Measure 31, the Andromeda galaxy, where scientists believe that they are both coming to, together. And, and I think it's about, well, different 
books give different time periods, but roughly around about three billion years, the two galaxies will, will probably merge and, and rip each other apart. So that'll be something to look forward to. Okay, um, another another area of science that, in astronomy that I, I sort of delve into every now and again is spectra, getting spectra. So this is a star analyzer, and I, I'm nearly finished. This is a star analyzer, and basically it's got 100 lines per millimeter um, etched onto the onto the grating here, and you put this onto the camera, and this is a photo of the jewel box taken with the the star analyzer, and you can see it creates a spectra here, and then you can run the spectra in software and start getting information from it. Fred Watson, who's a very well-known Australian speaker, a, a speaker of astronomy, basically said that oh, he, he quoted something like 90% of all the discoveries in astronomy have been made using spectra. So spectra really does bring out the information in the light. In fact, uh, here's a spectra I took of uh, Uranus. And by clicking on these different um, different radio buttons, you can actually, like here's a click, on, I clicked on methane here, and you can see that these dips here line up with the methane absorption lines of, of in the atmosphere of Uranus. So from Earth, astronomers can photograph something a long way away, in, like in our solar system, and, and then determine what's actually, what gases are actually in the atmosphere and so on by using spectra. Uh, here's another spectroized took, which is shocking because the star should be on the left-hand side, not, not the right. I was just starting in this. But this was a quasar, quasar 3C273. There's a spectra, spectra there, and you can see it's actually got, a, actually got a couple of little bright emission points here. And when I ran that spectra through, uh, through the software, you can see that these lines here, this, this is where the um, hydrogen alpha line should normally sit for an AO star, but with the quasar so far away that it's been redshifted, and this peak here, which should have been shift, sitting here, has been redshifted down this far, and by noting how far away these lines have moved, you can actually determine the, um, uh, the, the redshift to that quasar, and I think the next, no, the next, um, basically, by working out the redshift, I was able to work out that the distance to 3C273, that quasar, was um, about 2.144 uh, billion light years away. So not million, but billion light years away. So it's really neat to actually, with spectra, spectroscopy, uh, to be doing little projects like that, this and just learning more about the universe around us. And talking about lo learning the universe around us, Grant Christie, here he is on the left, and myself, uh, we were part of a team in New Zealand with the Ohio State University where we discovered a, um, a like an Earth-sized planet going around a binary star system uh, a few years ago. And that was the paper, there was a paper written about this and it was published in the journal Science. So that was that was quite a neat thing. So Grant, Jenny, they were the uh, the leaders in, in microlensing in New Zealand, the first to do microlensing with the Ohio State University. And then Grant actually talked me in his, into it. He said, John, you know, you know how to do astrophotography. You can take photos, so why not get some uh, do some science with it? So thanks to Grant, uh, I was able to get into microlensing and with the team and the Ohio State University, uh, discovered... Uh, I've helped discover about 20 planets going around other stars, exoplanets going around other stars. And here's an example of of uh, some photos taken over over time. You can see that this little star here is getting brighter as two stars line up, and then the foreground star acting like a magnifying glass. Einstein, thank Einstein for that equation. And then the star moves off, and the magnifying effect is gone, and you can see the star suddenly dropped out of um, out of brightness. So, and by that they can actually 
see if the little planet actually goes in front of the background star and the planet itself acts like a little uh, magnifying glass and gives you a bit of a blip on the on the graph and that will show you um, well Ohio State University analyzing the data will see if there's if it actually is a, is a planet um, with its own gravitational uh, micro lens. Okay, and the last thing, I, just recently, um, I just started up Gisborne Astro Tours. So people come out and I give them a tour around the Milky Way and so on. Actually, I give them a talk first about the basics of astronomy, give them a laser point of the constellations. And then with this 20-inch F2.9 telescope, it's a go-to telescope, so it slews to the target and tracks on the telescope, or on the target, instead of like, a lot of Dobsonians, you move it to the target and, and it's slowly the target will slowly move out of the field of view. This tel telescope will track on the um, target, so it's really handy. I can be talking to other people and they just one at a time go up and you don't have to go up there and to the telescope and, and, and readjust it and centre the target. So um, I started up this business week, just a week or two before the lockdown, had one tour, and then that was it. But thankfully now with the lockdown, I'm starting, people are starting to book tours now. So I run them on a Wednesday and a Saturday night. So it's gizmornastratours.co.nz. And uh, this is the lecture room. And it's we've just put this deck on here haven't quite finished the um, the top here, with a bit of a roof over the top. And this is inside the building. And got, all, got all these deck chairs. And so we do a tour, uh, do a, have a talk, do the astronomy outside, look through the telescopes, and then we come back in for a cup of um, tea and coffee and biscuits and so on. So it's about a, pretty around about a one and a half to two hour um, tour. And this is the roll-off roof observatory where the 20-inch F2.9 is sitting. And we, my brother, David, he's a very good carpenter. He uh, he made this deck and um, so people can sit around on the on the seats out here. And when it's their turn, they can go and have a look through the telescope and so on. And that's the telescope that, we, that I use. Uh, it's a Skywatcher and it has a black cover on it to shroud it. There it is there. And um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a very nice telescope, I must admit. And there's just some people looking through it. These are members of the Gisborne Astronomical Society Junior Section um, viewing through it. We had a barbecue out out here one one night. And I think but that's my last slide. So um, hopefully I haven't rabbited it on too much. And uh, there you go. Thanks very Thanks much. Thanks very much. John, that was uh, super interesting. Um, I only got one question, so if any of you've got any more questions, you can throw them in there. But a couple of things from me first. Um, I, you talk about um, seeing uh, naked eye comets and comets that are visible. Um, I'm from the Northern Hemisphere, and I fondly remember Comet Halbop in the late 90s, uh, which was a spectacular comet with uh, sort of two tails and... Yeah, I remember seeing that. You could see that before it got dark as well, and that's uh, that's really stuck with me um, over the years. Um, but a question, quick question from me first: um, What first got you interested uh, in astronomy, and uh, particular in into astrophotography? Um, yeah, well, <laughs> when I was about ten, my mother and I were walking back from a swimming pool. There's a swimming pool down the down at the road, um, about a kilometre or two from where I live. We lived down Rootney Road, and we used to go s swimming there, uh, you know, once a week or so. One night, when I was, like I say, when I was about 10, we are walking back, so heading east in summer, and at that, at that time, Orion was sort of coming up in the sky, and Mum looked up and she said, said look, John, there's, there's the pot. And she pointed out the pot and Orion to me, and it was just when she said it, just something went off inside me in, in my mind, and I was just absolutely fascinated with astronomy from that moment on. And it, it's really funny when when I buy a, a new telescope or a new mount or whatever, and you know, costs a bit of money. Uh, mum, mum often says, "Oh, why did I point the pot out to you?" You know. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, and as far as astrophotography, um, we had a box brownie in the family and and so I, I got into photography 
as another interest and it wasn't long before I actually combined the two astronomy and, and photography together and got into astrophotography. Ah, natural progression. Um, yeah. A question from Dave Marshall, um, who says you've got some great photos there, uh, but he says, can you please explain what causes a headless comet? Yeah, basically, there's been a few comets lately that have been disintegrating. So they come close to the sun, and, and as we said before, the, the comet head is just so... Uh, uh, so nebulous basically it's, it's a conglomeration of material as it comes close to the sun the gravity from the sun the solar radiation from the sun and so on can uh, can dis start disrupting the t the um the head and there's been a, a recent comet called oh it's called a uh, comet atlas i think it was called in the northern hemisphere we didn't see it down here but over over weeks, you could actually see the, the 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 head of the comet start breaking into two and then three and four pieces and so on, and then they've the the head basically has just become become an elongated uh, cloud with the tail coming aw away from it. So it's it's the influence of the sun. It's just basically just cut, it's so loose that it can't handle coming that close to the sun, and and it sort of breaks up. Fantastic. Uh, well, I think that is it for the questions. People are quite quiet tonight. Thanks very much for that. I think it was a really, really interesting presentation. I love seeing your photos there. Um, best of luck for uh, Gizman Astro Tours now that we're, we're into level one from tonight, which is yeah. great. Hope you get many, many tourists through. And thanks a lot for your really interesting talk tonight. Okay. No, thanks a lot for having me. Yay. No worries. Thanks. Good night. Okay. Cheers.